Welcome to a Practice Pro CPD, brought to you by LawPro. I'm Victoria Crew Nelson. I'm a Vice President at LawPro. And so what I get to focus on are the risks that lawyers face and try to come up with ways to mitigate those risks to find appropriate coverage to address dangers. And I'm in luck because my co-presenter is my friend and colleague, Judah. And uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Judah Strafchinski, and I am uh, the director of Practice Pro, which is Law Pro's uh, claims prevention and risk management program. Uh, and uh, we're just thrilled to join you today to talk about pro, po pro bono and uh, ways to manage risk and successfully deliver uh, legal services where there's unmet legal needs. So thanks for joining us. I think uh, Victoria will just walk us through the batting order of what we're going to hit today. All right, uh, so we're going to dive right in. And so when we're talking about pro bono, we're going to talk about the importance of it, why it's so great that you're interested in providing pro bono services to the public and what options you have when you're going to be providing those kinds of services. We're going to, of course, do insurance considerations because that's my bread and butter. Uh, but also we're going to talk about how to safely manage risk. So the first part is how to identify them. If you know the risk, you're less likely to fall into it, uh, how you manage the risks, and then what happens if you weren't successful. If you weren't able to manage the risk and a claim happens, if things go wrong, we'll walk you through that as well. And then Judah will take care of uh, some resources at the end of all this. And a lot of these uh, considerations that we'll be talking through are universal, so you can take these back to your practice generally. So let's talk about the importance of pro bono. And this is, you know, this is really preaching to the choir if you're here already, uh, but you all know that there are significant unmet legal needs uh, in Ontario. Uh, of course, we've got, uh, we have lots of studies that have documented uh, significant uh, uh, unmet legal needs uh, across the province uh, and by specific areas of law. If you go back to even uh, the Law Society Law Commission uh, report on uh, the Ontario, Ontario civil legal needs uh, or any other civil justice study uh, in Ontario or North America, the vast majority of legal problems uh, that people experience do not lead to them seeking information or advice from a lawyer. A lot of people just try to DIY or just uh, not even address the legal issue uh, that they are experiencing. And we've seen that in many areas of law. There is, of course, significant unmet legal need in family law in particular. Justice Boncalo, uh, her report addressed the extent of the unmet legal need with, in many courts, the vast majority of those appearing in court doing so as uh, unrepresented parties, uh, at times not by their own choice, but due to uh, lack of sufficient funds uh, to afford counsel. And so there's a real divide uh, in Ontario and generally in North America where there are significant justice gaps. And so it pro bono is one of the ways to try to meet that gap. And there are lots of reasons for pro bono. I mean, obviously the unmet legal needs, uh, the access to justice crisis is what drives this. People have talked about it though, in terms of both systemic and indiv individual reasons. And there's lots of academic scholarship about this, but generally in Ontario, uh, a couple of highlights. One is that there's no positive obligation to provide pro bono services, but the Law Society has generally encouraged lawyers to provide pro bono services as part of a professional uh, collective duty to make legal services available. And so if you look at uh, the rules of professional conduct, uh, there are a couple of areas where people describe, where the rules describe how there's almost an ethical rationale to uphold standards of the profession uh, by being collectively encouraged to uh, engage in pro bono services and to make legal services available uh, in efficient and convenient ways and pro bono where uh, appropriate. And so there's uh, this ethic, this, this, this uh, systemic professional obligation rationale. There's a, an access to justice rationale. There's a rule of law rationale that we want people to be able to access justice so that our systems are fair and seem to be fair. And of course, there's the professional monopoly argument, which is that 
uh, we have independent regulation, we have a quasi monopoly of services, and there may be a public expectation that in exchange for that, uh, services are made available. So those are some of the systemic reasons, but you're here already, you've decided that you're going to contribute, and there may be a range of individual reasons, and many of them are excellent reasons for being here. One is just a sense that you want to give back. Uh, one might be to support organizations that your values are aligned with. Uh, another might be that you're looking for opportunities to meet other like-minded individuals and professionals. You may be just looking for more meaningful work uh, to uh, complement your existing practice, and pro bono is one way to do that. Uh, another is to meet a different type of client and to stretch your skills. And of course, it's also, and this is a hidden benefit that we don't talk enough about, but it is a way to learn about how others and pro bono institutions, in, in, in fact, have managed to figure out risk management in a way to enhance the delivery of legal services and use innovation and technology to more effectively provide service, which is something that when we go out and partner with others to provide these legal services, we can think then in turn about how some of that process management, how those risk management frameworks might be adaptable to our own practices. So lots and lots of benefits, lots of reasons, but of course, preaching to the choir today. Okay, so ways to provide pro bono services. Okay, you can do it directly through your firm or uh, your in-house organization, or you could do it through an organization like this or Pro Bono Ontario. And people will ask what kind of lawyers provide pro bono work. And you can see it's students to retirees and every level of experience in between that. Uh, sometimes they do it through organizations like PBSC or Pro Bono. They might do it through a legal aid funded clinic. They provide services for certain types of clients. So in my old firm, every vet got free legal services. Uh, they might want to support a certain type of charity by doing their corporate work. Uh, they might provide low bono services where you just undercharge for certain clients because you know they can't really afford to access justice otherwise. Or you can always donate legal services, you know, uh, donating certain things at a silent auction or something to support a charity that you're interested in. Uh, Judah, do you have anything to add on picking your pro bono route? There are lots of ways. And so part of it will depend on, you know, your interests, your passions. If you're in a law firm setting, there may already be pro bono programs that are organized uh, at times in partnership with some of the uh, leading uh, not-for-profits that uh, in Ontario help deliver a pro bono services. So pro bono Ontario and pro bono students Canada are the obvious ones that come to mind. Uh, at the end of the day though, it's, it's up to you to decide uh, how you'd like to do, do pro bono services, uh, whether you'd like to do it uh, directly as a one-off for a client of your firm, uh, or if it's uh, through a structured program. And if you're going through a structured program, you wanna be comfortable with uh, the structure of that program. And so there are going to be things to consider. Uh, for example, with PBO or PBSC programs, uh, training, is it provided? And the happy answer is generally yes, there is some minimal training uh, before anyone gets to uh, meet a client live or provide legal services. Uh, there are questions about conflict of interest, which we'll get back to, but for short-term legal services, there may be fewer screening requirements for the particular program. They may have very carefully considered how to try to ensure that conflicts are avoided. You need to make sure that you are on a, that you don't know of any expressly aware conflicts. Otherwise, in those circumstances, you simply cannot act. But that doesn't mean that you wouldn't necessarily have another opportunity down the road. Uh, so you need to think about conflicts as you go. Uh, and use of technology, again, here, when working with organized pro bono providers, because of the volume and because of their structure, uh, both PBO and PBSC have invested very carefully on their process management and their practice management, as well as how to incorporate technology to enhance how legal services can be delivered by lawyers. And so you can look at, for example, on the family law initiatives by PBSC, how they are using programs such as DivorceMate, how there's practice management software on the back end to help ensure quality of documents that are being prepared. 
in Pro Bono Ontario, uh, their hotline is is uh, powered in part by Salesforce. There's a whole non knowledge management infrastructure involved to ensure that there are answers that are being provided in a timely, efficient uh, way that also meet particular quality standards. And so there's lots that we can learn by seeing how organizations have approached how to effectively deliver legal services. And again, uh, possible learning opportunities for you as you uh, contemplate uh, ways to give back. And as Victoria and I spend a lot of time thinking about, there's always the insurance coverage. And it's in our experience when people are trying to figure out whether or how to pro provide pro bono service and volunteer their time, insurance becomes a top of mind issue. The question, what happens if if there is a claim, what happens? Am I covered? It's a question that we have heard from pro bono organizations to us as a, a pressure point that their prospective volunteers ask about right off the bat. And one of the reasons we decided to record today's session and make it broadly available is to help to provide some upfront answers for those contemplating volunteering down the road. And so, uh, you know, there are different options. The PBSC program in family law, again, virtual legal clinic in this day and age, uh, but uh, lots of assistance available for parenting, child support, uh, restraining orders, uh, court forms, but not dealing with urgent matters, not dealing with child protection matters, not dealing with division of property. So again, when you think about your programs, you can think about, is this an area of high risk or relative low risk? And here, by not dealing with urgent matters, by not dealing with things that need to be done quickly, uh, where you're just stepping in, that's just one other way that the program itself has maintained a risk framework and put you out of higher risk areas. Similarly, we have pro bono programs uh, that have been approved by LawPro, and I'm going to ask Victoria to uh, talk a bit about those. Yeah, these uh, cover a range of things. The most popular one right now is the PBO hotline, but they've also got litigation assistance at the courthouses, at the hospitals. Um, and these things are intended to assist particularly vulnerable populations. Uh, so if you're looking at projects to get started with, these programs are approved by LawPro. So if you're in private practice and providing pro bono services through these projects, you don't have to pay a deductible or a claim surcharge if things go very badly on one of these uh, assistance programs. Uh, you can find a list of the approved pro bono projects on our website. And so people ask why it is that we have these uh, this special treatment, the Pro Bono Ontario approved projects. And it's because we have comfort. It's a matter of resources. We know that Pro Bono Ontario has training, monitoring, reporting associated with their programs. Each program is vetted to ensure it meets a community need, but also that it's gonna be run in such a way that it's gonna mitigate risk and provide sufficient support for all of the lawyers who are taking part in it. Um, on the other, you know, we know that the lawyers are going to have appropriate management tools. Uh, they're going to get support from other volunteers, that sort of thing. On the other hand, if we're not satisfied that a program meets, you know, a, an unmet legal need, a human rights need, an access to justice one, we're not going to approve it. Or if we're not satisfied that, you know, this specialist program has enough training and support to make sure that, you know, the lawyers with specialist knowledge or lawyers are given enough training in the specialist area, let's say immigration, that it's going to significantly reduce the risk of claims, then we're not going to be able to approve it. Uh, so again, the benefits of going with a, an approved pro bono project is that even if you retire, even if you go in-house counsel, in-house government, and you're not paying your law pro premiums anymore, you can still volunteer with these PBO approved programs. And we'll just treat it as though you provided the services when you were still in practice, even though you're not paying for insurance anymore. And I guess in, in summary, uh, when you're looking at all the different ways that people can volunteer and try to give back to the community, Law Pro just doesn't have the resources to oversee all of the different kind of initiatives that we would like to be able to do. And so what we're able to do is have this one-stop shop with Pro Bono Ontario. 
So that, that's to say that just because it's not a PBO program doesn't mean it isn't potentially one of the options available to you. I mean, the PBSC program is an excellent example of a program that uh, is uh, separately run, but uh, is, is one that uh, we would encourage people to consider. And so let's talk insurance coverage because that's where uh, the, the big questions arise for a lot of lawyers. And uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll break it up by practice area. Victoria touched a bit upon uh, some of the options, but let's just talk about it in general. And, and we have a resource online at lawpro.ca that describes all of this in detail. Uh, if you even just go to lawpro and put in pro bono in the search function, it'll be the first piece that comes up is our pro bono page. But the bottom line is that insurance depends on many factors. And so the availability and terms of coverage depends on your current practice sat status and the service you're going to be providing. And so to unpack that, um, let's start Victoria, because this really is Victoria's bread and butter. So Victoria, if you're in private practice, what do you need to know? Uh, I'm, I'm going to start by just saying, you know, people are concerned. Well, I'm not necessarily providing the services through my firm. I'm providing them outside, so I probably don't have coverage. And LawPro ensures you, like you get the coverage. It's not issued under your firm name, it's issued to you. So whether you're providing services through your firm in your spare time uh, against your firm's wishes, as long as you're providing professional services, we're probably gonna be in there with you. We're probably gonna provide coverage to you. Um, so again, I'm not gonna talk about the PBO approved programs, but generally what would happen is that if you're a practicing lawyer uh, you'd be expected to have a million dollars in coverage. You'd have to pay the same deductible as what you chose when you applied for or renewed your coverage for the year. Uh, if a claim is paid out, you know, sometimes depending on your deductible, you might not have to even pay it depending on the type of claim that you've reported and what actions we've had to take. On the other hand, if we've had to make an indemnity payment, if we've had to do a repair, you might also have to pay a claims history levy surcharge, which increases your premiums for a five-year period. But again, it's a million dollars in coverage that you've got, so it's a lot of peace of mind. Uh, of course, if you were part of the PBO program, then discount what I said about the uh, uh, deductible and the claim surcharge. And so that's for people who are in private practice. Mm -hmm. And then there are people, and we hear about this from time to time, they'll call our, our uh, customer service group and ask uh, how they can engage in pro bono services when they're not in active practice or uh, they're in-house counsel uh, or they're not paying law pro premium. So can you walk us through how that can work and what's open and what's not to, to people who aren't in private practice? Well, if, if you're an in-house corporate lawyer, so normally you only provide legal services to your employer, usually you can get off of having to pay law pro premiums. You go on exemption. But if you want to keep providing pro bono services outside of for your employer, uh, unless, unless it's for a PBO approved program, uh, then you should maintain your practice coverage. You can have it on a part-time basis. It's only 50% of the normal premium, so about $1,500 a year. But it gives you a lot of peace of mind. And especially if you're like me, where you have a hard time stopping, uh, giving a little bit of advice to people, it gives you that protection. Um, now, on the other hand, so if you are not paying your premiums at all and you don't want to be paying your premiums, but you want to provide some services and it's not through a PBO approved program, there is one other option. And this is where you write into us and you say, I want to provide legal services to a not-for-profit organization, only for the organization, not for its clients or members. Uh, can I not pay law pro premiums? We'll have a look at it. We'll see what the risk is. And as long as you're upfront with the organization, we might say, yes, you can provide the legal services, but it's what we call in the insurance world going bare. You don't have any insurance <laughs> coverage. So, you know, a lot of lawyers are, uh, I mean, we're trained to spot risk and there is obviously some risk in doing it that way. Uh, but if it is an organization you're comfortable with, it's a, if it's an organization you've worked with in the past, if they have their own insurance that would cover you, or they've already confirmed with you that they're willing to assume the risk of any negligent advice by you, then maybe that's an option. 
Uh, certainly not for the faint of heart, but uh, if you do want to do it, you need to write us first, correct? Yes, and I can think of 30 scenarios where things go badly. And so I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> give you an example. I was thinking about this one. So imagine that there's like a, a volleyball club that you're a member of and you want to help them with a lease matter. They're going to be renting out an indoor space. And so you write to us and say, I'm going to help them just negotiate the terms of this lease. Can I do it without having coverage in place? And we say, okay, sure. And so the volleyball club, perfectly aware of it. But there's a clause in that tenancy agreement that says the volleyball club has to maintain insurance. And you didn't tell the volleyball club this. And of course, a claim rises and there is an insurance in place. So of course the volleyball club gets sued over it. And of course you get brought into the action. It's not that the volleyball club wants to sue you. It's that this is just naturally what happens when something really bad happens. And so these are the reasons why I highly recommend the part-time practice coverage option instead. Yeah, there's uh, for, for those of us who specialize in insurance at risk, it's all about managing it, but there are certainly many different examples that we could think of uh, around why going alone without any coverage would be pretty high risk, especially when there are other ways to provide pro bono uh, through approved programs or uh, through programs where you would continue to have coverage. So assuming you are going to go and pr provide the coverage, uh, it's important to know about the different types of risks when delivering pro bono services. And so uh, we at LawPro, because we ensure the entirety of lawyers in private practice, uh, we have claims data that helps drive uh, our risk management. And we're able to see when people report claims to us. And these are uh, complaints about lawyers. They don't necessarily mean that they've been sued, but anytime a lawyer is concerned that somebody is dissatisfied with their work, or there's a claim that they've messed up, even if it's not uh, uh, not borne out on the on the facts. When they report to LawPro, we code them, and here's what we see over the last decade or so. And uh, these are from 2009 to 2019. Uh, we're still looking at the 2020 data uh, because certain uh, matters have just come in. Point being is these numbers would not change much over uh, over the recent period. But what you can see is communication errors are number one by far. Time management. In inadequate investigation collectively are tied for second. And in third is error of law. And if we look at it by the cost to the program, communication almost at a, uh, at a full third of our cost, error of law is up at 18% with inadequate investigation, time management at 15%. Communication errors are things like the client not understanding the implications of a decision because they did not understand what you told them. They can be communication errors like a retainer agreement not being clear as to the scope and a client thinking something is going to be done for them when it wasn't. It can be a client not fully understanding the terms of a settlement agreement uh, or not understanding the full implications of uh, taking a step in uh, litigation or elsewhere. It can be in wills and estates where a client has expressed certain things to the lawyer and the lawyer didn't fully understand what they meant and didn't spend the time to fully understand uh, what the client had intended. Time management in litigation actually becomes the biggest piece of the pie because if, especially if you're plaintiff side, you're deadline driven. You have to meet your deadlines. You cannot wait until the expiration of a limitation period. At that point, your client is cooked. Uh, if you have started an action, you have five years to get it through. Otherwise, it can be dismissed for delay. And so there are lots of uh, potential roadblocks or, uh, you know, sh shoots in the shoots and ladders game of litigation. So you have to be really careful. Inadequate investigation is where the lawyer just hasn't taken enough time to get to know the client's case, doesn't understand the full uh, intent of why the, the client is there or hasn't dug deep enough to understand the situation. And at times that's missing key documents. At times it's making assumptions about what the client would like by way of outcome. At times it's where there, the information is in the documents, but you miss it along the way. And we've seen that uh, recently during COVID, for example, lawyer has a document, but it's in their office and they have to stay home because of a COVID scare and are reviewing, forgetting that part of the ream is in hard copy only back in the office, 
and key documents are not taken into account before legal advice is given, that's a clear example of an inadequate investigation that could be negligent and could lead to exposure. Error of law is uh, another area that's been ticking up. And during COVID, laws have been changing very rapidly. So if you're an employment lawyer, if you're a labor lawyer, if you are an immigration lawyer, there have been all sorts of changes uh, to programs and to what is permitted and what is not. Uh, for the poor employment bar over 2020, uh, things were changing at times weekly in terms of what supports were there, what programs were there, corporate commercial lawyers also, bankruptcy lawyers, what would be the best approach given federal government, provincial government programs for leases and others. So that's been another risk area. Now, depending on where you are thinking of doing pro bono service, we'd highly encourage you to look at our malpractice claims fact sheets, which are available at practicepro.ca. Particularly for family law, you'll see that a lot of the key risks relate around, uh, around client expectation and client management. And so when you're with an organized program where the scope is clear, where there is intake, triage, and a clear expectation of deliverable, that helps you reduce your risk while providing pro bono services. COVID is, as I mentioned, changed the game, and there are a lot of significant risks that have shifted. Uh, a lot of them have been practice management related uh, and change management related. So we're all working remote. Uh, there have been new technologies that we've needed to embrace, such as the one we're using right now to meet because we cannot in person. There are new document management requirements at times. And we see, for example, the need for uh, the ability to communicate and delegate and work remotely with others. In pro bono programs, sometimes that means a lawyer is meeting with a student virtually. It means you're meeting with a client virtually. And so we need to take the time to work with clients uh, and meet them in this new medium. And that creates new risks uh, around time management and making sure that you have all the information from clients who may not be comfortable meeting by video. It may mean in some cases meeting more than once with the client or having shorter meetings by video that are perhaps directed by theme or by, by particular areas so that you get your full story. Again, here though, one of the benefits from working with organized pro bono providers is they often have processes in place to help you manage a remote setting and have already done a lot of the homework to help you figure out the conveyor belt of sorts so that you can take something from initial call or initial intake through to a successful completion of a limited scope or other matter. And so here, COVID presents risks, but they can be managed. And by partnering with pro bono providers, that's one way to potentially reduce your risks. But there are other risks around pro bono that you need to be aware of. And again, that's just to be aware of them and hopefully manage them effectively. It's not to scare you away from potentially taking on retainers. It's just making sure that the retainer is right for you. So one is managing conflicts. And if you're in a pro bono environment, they may have their own conflict screening, but at the end of the day, if you are aware of an existing engagement that may create a conflict, a known conflict or a risk of a conflict, you should not act. So there may be different requirements on the rules in terms of what you need to do to see whether there's a, cl a client conflict, but if you know there's a conflict, you cannot act. On communication, uh, or, or sorry, just on conflicts, again, if you're in your law firm setting, you need to screen for conflicts, even if it's a pro bono client. Nothing changes that way. And we'll have more to say about the firm environment in a moment. On communication, again, uh, it's not just about Zoom. It's not just about, com about communication in a remote setting. Depending on the nature of your retainer, if you're working for a vulnerable client and you normally work for sophisticated clients, there is an element of cultural competency that comes into play here. You cannot assume that your client understands things the way that a general counsel client might for you. And so there is time that you will need to spend in training with your peers, in reading, in learning about the demographic you're about to serve to make sure that you can communicate effectively with your new clients if you choose to serve a different demographic. For time management, 
again, certain steps may take longer in our current environment, they also tend to take longer with certain types of vulnerable populations. And so here again, you might be able to go through certain key documents and the terminology is familiar to a general counsel. Uh, it may be routine for them. They may say, yeah, fire away, go ahead, it's all easy. With a vulnerable client or with an, a client who does not have legal training, you will likely need to focus more on plain language, clear communication, and possibly take breaks as you review materials. So it will take longer. And if you're used to working with other corporate commercial or sophisticated clients, this will require a period of slowing down and making sure that you're meeting the client at their level and able to uh, ensure that you have the information you need and the confirmations from your client so that you're all on the same page. And again, knowing the law here, if you're engaging in pro bono services where it's a pivot for you, if you're an in-house counsel thinking of doing wills, that's a caution area. Do not dabble into areas you do not know. You should practice assuming that the new area that you are going into requires expertise just like your regular practice requires expertise. Social justice law, access to justice areas require expertise. They can be very complex areas of law. And so do not dabble. You always have to meet the standard of care of a reasonably prudent lawyer when you're offering legal services, regardless of whether it's free or not. So you can't just shift from one area to another without learning that area first. And so you need to train up, you need to learn that other area. And if, for example, that means taking a course or sitting in on intake meetings or attending training programs, all the better for you to become that competent lawyer able to pivot into a new area to assist, but to do so in a way that meets the client's needs. So you need to learn the substantive law in the area you're taking on. You need to learn how to be culturally competent, perhaps if you're shifting to a different client demographic. Uh, that was an amazing summary of uh, claims risks. So I'm just gonna follow up with two uh, other types of risks that I want you to think about when you're providing pro bono services. And especially, I'm gonna start with professional risks if you're working in a firm environment. And I'm gonna exhort you, please, be transparent with your employer about your pro bono activities. If you're going to want to use your firm's equipment, uh, support staff, if you're going to do your volunteer work during office hours, you have to let your employers know about this. Otherwise, they're going to view it as theft. And that's not something that Law Pro covers. Um, as well, if your firm acts for, let's say, um, like a, a oil companies and you do volunteer work with an environmental group that targets that oil company, besides the obvious conflict, there's also going to be reputational harm for your employer and this is not going to be good for you. So if you're committed to doing pro bono work, have a frank discussion with your firm at the time of hiring and I can almost guarantee you're going to be pleasantly surprised by the support that they're going to want to give you in this regard. And then my second one is going to be on the emotional risks and making sure that you're taking care of yourself when you're providing pro bono services, because it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you've made a mistake or not. You can't control if somebody makes a complaint to the law society, if somebody brings a completely meritless claim against you in small claims court. It can be a disappointed client you've had or a disappointed opposing party who wasn't happy with the result you got. You can't stop them from going forward with these kinds of things. And so I want you to think about within the organization that you're doing your pro bono work, if you have a mentor that you can go to and talk about your concerns about this sort of thing, uh, in your wider network, are there people who you can talk to about this? And whether you have those resources or not, I want you to think about the fact that there are counseling services, there are peer support services available through the Homewood uh, Members Assistance Program that are free for all of us. And they can be really useful just to check in, make sure that you're maintaining your mental wellness or in case of a crisis. Sure, and we're already jumping ahead into some of the tips to manage pro bono risk. And those are some great tips from Victoria. 
you know, you get to choose your path. And so we've spent some time focusing on that. You have a career path. Generally, you have a practice. Generally, pro bono can be part of that path. And you get to decide how you want to provide pro bono and make sure you've got the insurance you need and want for it. Uh, and, you know, as Victoria mentioned, talk to your firm about how they uh, wish pro bono to be performed uh, and use your, your firm processes for PBSC's program uh, for uh, the family justice, they're going to ask uh, that you conduct a conflict check, for example, which is uh, a, a helpful risk prevention uh, effort. And so uh, you want to make sure that your firm is aware that you're being you're getting involved in the pro bono initiative and uh, use your firm's uh, resources where uh, appropriate. And so you'll want to make sure that you are uh, well equipped and and able to pick a path that works for you. In terms of uh, the risks, of course, we've talked about some of these. We've talked about avoiding conflicts, and we, we stress that in part because we don't want people uh, to end up dinged uh, on our end uh, when claims can be avoided. Um, but of course, professionalism is at the core of all of this. When you're engaging in pro bono services, and again, preaching to the choir if you're here already, but you need to treat that client as you would any other client in terms of the level of professionalism uh, and, uh, and uh, degree of, of detail and, and, uh, and competency as you would any other client. Uh, client management, of course, requires getting to know your client and spending the time to get to know that client. Uh, you may have thought that a commitment pro bono would only be X hours uh, like any other managed service where you think something might take X hours to start and it takes Y hours instead. You have to just see it through and uh, that's just part of the delivery of services. That means managing your time, putting in buffers, assuming that you're going to need more time to dig deeper, and of course, don't dabble. So if you're going to decide to stretch and use pro bono as an opportunity to pivot into a new area or explore a new area of law or new clientele, make sure that you've taken uh, steps to, uh, to learn the substantive and think through and learn about the clientele you'll be serving. In terms of money, uh, one of the good news stories here is that money is not going to be a stress factor for you most of the time as a pro bono provider, which is great because money often, those difficult conversations can lead to people getting frustrated because they think they've overpaid for service or aren't satisfied with the result and a bill dispute turns into a negligence claim and then we're involved. That's not going to be a problem here. There is far less risk than where there are paid retainers in this regard. Uh, one area of risk is to be sure that people know who is going to cover certain costs in disbursement. If you are taking on a litigation matter pro bono, for example, the court filing fees, photocopying fees, other types of fees, retaining of experts, if you get that far on a, on a larger file, those can be significant. And if your client uh, believes that it is a full pro bono experience, they may not believe that they would be responsible for those disbursements. And there are many within the profession who will go to that degree of paying for disbursements because they believe in a client's cause or have decided that this is one where they would support a cause. But you can't take it as given, especially if you didn't think you were going to be footing any of those disbursements. And so you need to be transparent and clear about who's responsible for those types of costs. Also for advocates, there is case law that suggests that in some cases you might even be able to seek costs. And so this is something that can benefit pro bono generally. There is simply no prohibition on courts awarding costs for pro bono counsel work in the right circumstances. And so this typically doesn't occur in limited scope retainer, short day of court type of work, but when people are taking on larger systemic cases or cases where there are motions that are fought tooth and nail at the outset, there is some case law where courts have awarded costs payable forthwith. There are some uh, instances where the court will consider directing payment to a lawyer uh, who has acted pro bono in order to defray the cost to the professional who is providing the pro bono services that are going to be ongoing. So just something to keep in mind um, in order to think about how you can ensure that money disputes 
uh, while they are unlikely to occur, are even less likely to occur in this area. So if, if things go wrong, Victoria is going to tell us what, what to do. Uh, so if things go wrong, report in. Honestly, um, we're here to help. Uh, it's the easiest thing to provide law pro with notice and there's no judgment that goes along with it. Most lawyers end up having to report a claim over the course of their practice. And we'll walk you through, even if you think you might have just a potential claim, maybe we can help you repair it before it actually turns into a real problem. And it's a really simple process too. There's just a button when you go to lawpro.ca to claims, there's that provide a note, provide notice of a claim button. And, uh, you know, we've seen claims where people have given notice and our claims council have looked at it and closed the file within 24 hours. We've seen others that have taken some time, but there's no shame and no harm in letting us know and we can help guide you through uh, the risk analysis, the assessment and what, uh, and make sure that you're meeting your ethical obligations of communicating with your client if there in fact was an error uh, along the way and, and how to address that. So here are the key takeaways. So first off, thank you. Thanks for stepping up. Thanks for looking into, for exploring, uh, participating in pro bono. Pro bono obviously has lots of upside and frankly, very little downside for lawyers. And that's the key here, especially if you have insurance coverage set up. We're here to help. And we've been trying to support pro bono where possible with these sort of MacGyver efforts to provide coverage uh, in different situations that are uh, pro bono. So you've hopefully seen some of the risks through this presentation. The key here is not to scare you, it's to help you manage them just like any other area of practice. And so you can be proactive to lower your risks so that you can confidently step out and provide pro bono services. To learn more, go to Law Pro to the pro bono page. It's uh, right there. If you use our search function, it'll take you through the coverage needs. Uh, again, we support pro bono initiatives. And so we have made it easy for you to learn about the insurance. You can also call our customer service line if you have any questions. For more tips for the practice management uh, risk areas and tips on how to uh, reduce your risks while practicing, you can check out Practice Pro, which is our claims prevention and risk management page. To stay on alert for updates in these areas around claims prevention, risk management, and fraud, we'd recommend you subscribe to our Avoid a Claim blog, which has an RSS feed that can send you push notifications when new materials come available. And again, thank you so much for stepping up. Good luck, and please stay in touch with Victoria and with me. Uh, we're here to help. <laughs>